Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. In the last video we briefly discussed these two polarization maps from Planck. You recall that the signals in those maps were extremely weak. In fact, the signals were so weak that several viewers believed that the maps were devoid of data. But these two maps do have data, as can be established if the originals are downloaded from the NASA website linked below. Remember, these four maps represent the polarized foreground signals extracted by the Planck satellite from channel data. The idea that these four polarized microwave foreground maps can be used to extract these two polarization and isotropy maps is not reasonable. The point being, once again, that it is impossible to extract a weak signal from powerful overlying signals. That is also why I emphasize the events associated with BICEP2 and the pathological aspects of reporting 15 to 30 cosmological parameters from anisotropy data buried under the foreground. Now we should return to the central question, namely, where is the monopole? We begin with this figure from the COBE team displaying the famous monopole spectrum observed at an altitude of 900 kilometers with the satellite in polar orbit as we saw in this video. It is this monopole which is central, for without it any anisotropy map collected at L2 is nothing but astrophysical noise, a collection of microwave emissions produced by galaxies which has nothing to do with the Big Bang or cosmology. The same monopole spectrum must be collected at L2 as was obtained by COBE, or at least several points on the curve must be obtained, but this has never happened. Now relative to measuring the monopole near the Earth, it is important to discuss a result from a rocket which took place just before the launch of COBE, the famous Berkeley-Nagoya experiments. These results are important enough that Mather's description will now be presented in full. Here is what he said. A greater shock to the Kobe team, especially to me since I was in charge of the Fierce instrument, was an announcement made in 1987 by a Japanese-American team headed by Paul Richards, my old mentor and friend at Berkeley, and Toshio Matsumoto of Nagoya University. The Berkeley-Nagoya group had launched from the Japanese island of Kyushu a small sounding rocket carrying a spectrometer some 200 miles high. During the first few minutes it was able to generate data, the instrument measured the cosmic microwave background at six wavelengths between 0.1 mm and 1 mm. The results were quite disquieting to say the least, that the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background showed an excess intensity as great as 10% at certain wavelengths, creating a noticeable bump in the black body curve. The cosmological community buzzed with alarm. The question is, why was the signal 10% too high? It is well known that condensation in microwave horns can produce spurious signals, as I discuss in this paper. Perhaps this was the cause, or perhaps some signal was diffracting into the horns from below and greater proximity to the ground or instrument orientation was such that excess microwave was coming from the Earth. If you read my paper on the Kobe satellite, you will find numerous examples of water causing havoc with microwave background measurements. Here are some choice examples. An invisible patch of water drifted overhead. The scanner showed a rise in temperature. Good, this meant the instrument was working because water vapor was a source of stray radiation. And again, temperature, pressure, and constituent inhomogeneities occur and in fact are the largest source of random noise in ground-based experiments. However, they do not contribute systematic errors unless the particular observing site is anisotropic in a gross manner because of a large lake or the ocean in the direction of the zenith scan, for example. The atmospheric and CBR contributions are separable in this case without further measurement or modeling. Relative to British work on the Canary Islands, John Mather wrote, Their job was unusually difficult because Atlantic weather creates patterns in the air that can produce signals similar to cosmic fluctuations. It took the English scientists years to eliminate this atmospheric noise. Relative to another experiment, John Mather wrote, the effect of air condensing into the antenna were seen. When the second window was open, the valve which controls the gas flow should have been rotated such that all the gas was forced out through the cone and horn. When this situation was corrected, the emissions from the horn were reduced as cold helium has cooled the surfaces on which the air has condensed and the signal returned to its normal level. Here is a quotation from George Smoot relative to the radiometer for a balloon launched in South America. It is much more humid in the tropics and as the plane descended from the cold upper air into Lima, 
The chili equipment condensed the humidity into water. As a result, water collected into the small sensitive waveguides that connect the differential microwave radiometer's horns to the receiver. We had to take the receiver apart and dry it. Our equipment had dried, and so we reassembled it and tested it. It worked. Clearly, water presents a huge problem for microwave background measurements. In any case, you recall in this video that Penzias and Wilson had no trouble measuring a monopole value when they were at low elevation near the oceans. Their horn antenna, however, was subject to picking up diffracted signals from its surroundings. In fact, after careful consideration, it is highly questionable that these men ever obtained any signal from the celestial sky. It is more likely that the signal came from the oceans. In this regard, let us return briefly to this video where Professor Paris Haruni's radio telescope in Armenia was discussed. You might recall that Professor Haruni was perhaps the premier radio engineer in the Soviet Union, and that is why he was able to convince the Central Committee to build this antenna in Armenia. Soon after the telescope was operational, Paris Haruni published this paper reporting a radio flare on the Eta Gemini star. According to Professor Sargassan, there were many presentations about the findings of this antenna just prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union, as you can learn by reviewing her presentations linked below. Professor Haruni also published at least two papers on the self-noise of this antenna. You might recall that one of these papers reported that there was no Big Bang that paper mysteriously disappeared from the Journal of Applied Electromagnetism. In this video, I recorded how it was only through the perseverance of a few scientists, ultimately through the direct efforts of Stephen Crothers, that Haruni's paper was restored, although not in the correct journal volume. Links regarding this affair are linked below. In any case, the device was clearly operational. Now here is something to catch your interest. Wikipedia keeps a list of radio telescopes which can be accessed through the links provided below. If you examine the old records for this list, you will be able to read the following entry under Europe relative to Professor Haruni's antenna. ROT 54-2.6 Mount Aragats, Armenia, near Yerevan, 1.5 to 300 gigahertz. Radio optical telescope with 54 meter spherical reflector antenna and a 2.6 meter optical telescope on the same axis. And here is the key sentence. One of the most sensitive and low noise antennas in the world. However, Wikipedia has now changed the entry to read ROT 54 slash 2.6 Mount Aragats, Armenia, near Yerevan, 1.5 to 300 gigahertz. Radio optical telescope with 54 meter spherical reflector antenna and 2.6 meter optical telescope on the same axis. This telescope was never operating from the date of its installation. That is clearly not true. It seems that the cosmologists are even willing to change history. In fact, Haruni's antenna did function and he managed to publish a few papers before the Soviet Union collapsed. The important thing is that Haruni's edgeless antenna located high in the mountains of Armenia and well away from the oceans failed to detect a sky signal. Astronomers might now try to claim that the antenna did not function, but truth says otherwise. They cannot make a reasonable case that Professor Haruni did not understand how to build a radio telescope. He was a world-renowned expert and his findings cannot be dismissed. Professor Haruni used his antenna to report that there was no Big Bang as he was unable to measure any significant signal from the sky. This is the point and that is why his work is now being suppressed. Keep this in mind whenever a cosmologist tries to tell you that they have measured a monopole associated with the birth of the universe. In any event, in this video, we saw that neither WMAP or Planck ever reported a monopole at L2. WMAP was incapable of doing so, yet the Planck satellite should have been able to give us the same curve as COBE, but never did. They should have provided these points onto the COBE spectrum. We need to consider why this never happened. After all, the HFI on the Planck satellite was made up of volumeters, which are able to do absolute measurements. Yet in this video, I highlighted this statement from the Planck team. Planck cannot accurately measure the monopole, uniform part of the emission, because many sources contribute, telescopes, horns, filters. Initially, I accepted this argument, as you can learn in this paper. 
But on further reflection, something is just not right here. Penzias and Wilson detected the 3K signal on Earth, and they had equipment based on 1960s technology. They essentially used a bucket to collect their data. Now the Planck team with a billion dollar satellite tells us that their telescope mirrors, horns and filters are the problem. Horns and filters were never a problem for Penzias and Wilson, nor for the Kobe team. The later extracted a monopole with signal to noise so elevated that the error bars were lost in the line width of the graph. If the monopole signal was so powerful for Kobe, why was it not immediately reported by Planck? Since the signal to noise from space is supposed to be so strong, what is going on? If the Planck team really believes that they can remove the foreground accurately, which they can never properly understand, then why can they not remove the contributions from mirrors, filters, and other hardware, which they should be able to understand? Clearly, it does not make sense to present anisotropy maps with plus or minus 300 microkelvin maximal scale and tell everyone that they cannot isolate the monopole signal from contamination effects down to the same level of precision. This is especially true given that for the HFI, the Planck team is dealing with bolometers, which take absolute measurements. Something is just not right here. In fact, it is interesting to highlight how the Planck team attempts to give us a value for the monopole at L2, because they do not do it using absolute measurements. We get the answer from this paper, where the Planck team combines baryon acoustic oscillations with anisotropy maps in order to calculate a value for the monopole. Baryon acoustic oscillations are said to be fluctuations in the density of protons and neutrons, which are caused by acoustic density waves in the primordial plasma of the early universe. As a result, if the Big Bang never happened, as Eric Lerner has long claimed, then baryon acoustic oscillations are not real, and nothing but a cosmological unicorn. In any event, the cosmologists used the 3D mapping of the local universe obtained from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey to then search for baryon acoustic oscillations. Frankly, such an approach is completely unreasonable. The Planck team claims that they need baryon acoustic oscillations to break the degeneracy obtained in determining the monopole value if such additional data is not introduced. In other words, by introducing baryon acoustic oscillations, they can calculate any monopole value they like. The idea that the anisotropy maps can tell us anything about an isotropic monopole is completely unreasonable. The Planck team needed to give us a measured monopole value directly from its bolometers and the LFI just like Colby did, without invoking indirect methods, which are nothing but theoretical illusions. This is a very important point. The Planck team must measure the monopole, not calculate it. In the next video, we will discuss the 4K reference loads on the LFI of the Planck satellite. That discussion will reveal that this satellite was never able to properly assess the low frequency signals at L2. Well, that is all for today. If you enjoyed the video, promote the channel, mention the video to your friends and your local astronomy club, support me with a like, and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below, and I'll see you soon on our next video.